Who's actually been there? We have a few. Who um, knows about the wines and about the region of Central Otago? I guess that's why you're here. Okay, that's wonderful. Now that really helps helps us to understand. So the first thing, and I wondered what the what the catchphrase should be on on um, on the start of this presentation. And I thought the first thing you should know is that it, in here in Central Otago, everything is beautiful. And um, I just have a few <laughs> slides to show what. Unfortunately, this is where we have to work. And and this is this is the definition of a um, of a traffic jam, by the way. That, that <laughs> I thought it was a car one. That's a traffic jam. And um, this is uh, one of the vineyards. We have a lot of beautiful uh, natural uh, forests in New Zealand. This is one of the um, vineyards in the Wanaka region. It's Lake Wanaka. This is going to misbehave, I think, this presentation. So, um, and this is a winter, typical winter scene. We don't have snow there all the time in winter, but we get a few uh, times a year we'll get snow right on the vineyard. So New Zealand is a couple of quite large islands <coughs> off the coast of Australia, a long way off the coast of Australia. It's uh, quite surprising to people when they come there for the first time that it's not just two small islands that you can get on a scooter and drive around one in the morning, one in the afternoon, so it's a, a very large country. If we took this to Europe, and of course it would be tipped upside down, we would be going from the north of France to the south of Spain, as the, as the geographical um, length of the, of the country. Um, we have several wine producing regions. Um, Auckland, uh, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, the Wairarapa, Marlborough, of course, with the um, famous for Sauvignon Blanc, uh, the Nelson region, uh, Waipara in Canterbury, and then, of course, Central Otago, which is where, um, where we're from. So it's a, it's a huge span of latitudes from 34 to 47. So we go from quite a warm growing region to definitely cool climate. And Central Otago definitely comes into that cool climate side of things. A thousand miles from one end to the other. It's a long way. And of course with, the, with that massive distance and um, we're, we're going to have a huge diversity of different climates and soil types. And also a large range of regional uh, flavours and, and differences and characteristics. Just some data and, and really the whole point of this is to I guess identify that Central Otago was quite different from the other region. First thing you notice is that Central Otago is, is right on 45 degrees south. The, the 45th parallel runs right through the middle of our grape growing region. And uh, the point to note about that is that 45 North also runs through Burgundy. And um, something seems to happen on the 45th parallels. Um, the sun does some pretty strange things that uh, Pinot Noir really, really enjoys. The next thing you notice from the other wine regions is um, they're all at sea level. 98 feet, 55, 101 feet, whereas Central Otago, we're high. We're at about 700 feet above sea level. Um, all the um, regions of, of Central Otago are reasonably dry, but uh, of New Zealand rather, are reasonably dry. But Central Otago is particularly dry. Um, I'll show you in, in a slide coming up that we're a very continental um, area. <coughs> So here we have a um, <coughs> picture of the, of the southern part of the South Island. Um, the wine-grown region of Central Otago is here, 
and predominantly here. So there's a few things that you notice. First one is we're a long way from the east coast. It's about 140 kilometers inland. The second thing is from the west coast there's these range of mountains and these are real mountains. Not what the Australians call mountains. These are, <laughs> these are real mountains, um, over 10,000 feet um, peaks. And between this west coast and the wine region of central Otago, there's seven ranges. The uh, important thing about that is the predominant weather patterns come in from this direction, from the southwest, and these ranges prevent any moisture. Uh, or very, very little moisture from actually reaching into to this region here. So we're in a, in a rain shadow of, uh, of the Southern Alps. And we, we have virtually no influence from this coast because we're so far away from it. Um, what that means is we get beautifully hot, dry summers and we get cold, dry winters. Um, Within um, central Otago, we have uh, many subregions. So, Gibson is one area. Uh, <laughs> you know what's coming anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have these the subregions of, of Gibson, uh, the Cromwell Basin area, Bannockburn, Bendigo, Wanaka and Alexandra. And each of these sub-regions um, bring something different to the, um, to the, to the, to the table. Um, it's interesting, in, in 2009 um, we had a, our Pinot celebration and, um, and if you guys want a real treat you should um, enrol to come down to the uh, Central Otago Pinot Noir celebrations. We, we had them at the end of January um, two years out of three. So keep, keep an eye open for that. But um, in the 2009 um, celebration, the theme was sub-regionality of Central Otago because the world is, understands Central Otago, but they don't understand so much the sub-regionality of it. And we invited um, Jean-Luc Pepin from Comte Georges de Vaudoy down to be the the critic, if you like, to, to uh, really examine the sub-regionality. And um, I'm not sure we got the answer we were looking for, but it was, uh, it was very interesting to really uh, look into that. Uh, Jean-Luc's conclusion was that no, he can't see any sub-regional terroir emerging yet. More the, the hand of the people involved. Uh, but that's a very important part as well. And um, so I think when we're maybe graduating out of kindergarten and into primary school, hopefully there we can see some sort of sub-regional character coming through because we're, we're still a very, very young um, producing um, region of the world. Um, so I think the best thing we can do now is to um, tackle what's in front of you. Um, let's test. Sure. Um, oh, pretty complicated. <laughs> yeah, we can go into some of that. It's uh, well, the terroir is made up of many, many things. Firstly, the 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 sites, the soils, the aspects, um, what's happening around about that area. Um, very much the, the people involved in the in the vineyard the um, people involved in the winery all contribute to the terroir and um, what we were hoping to see in this uh, 2009 conference was that you could definitely see something common from uh, say Bannockburn region or from the Bendigo region but uh, the conclusion was that not yet we can't see that. But I think the vines are still quite young. I think, I think there was outsiders see it less than we're starting to see. Yeah. I think we do. Um, there are certain characters that we're, we're getting a handle on. Gibson 
always has a brambly character to it. It's denser, earthier. Um, it's a cooler area when it rains more, and that may be connected with that. But the soils there are very different to the soils we see in most of the other areas. Um, largely because of the way they've weathered down from the hills, where most of the other areas, their glacial soils would have been blown down or washed down from the places up here in the north, uh, up north of Lake Monica. Um, so you, you definitely see that. We definitely see Bendigo has a more masculine character. Would you agree, Mark? That kind of, it's our courton. It's a, it's a little bit like that. The, the yeah. What we're finding within these re sub regions, there are also v various um, elements there. For example, Bendigo, the early plantings were around a road called the Loop Road, and the wines from that area are very, very different from the wines we're seeing now from the high terraces of Bendigo. Yeah. So there's uh, two terraces there and um, producing some pretty interesting wines. Uh, and the, for example, uh, two of the wines you're going to try today, one is from the High Terrace of Bendigo, and the other is from the Loop Road. So the Quartz Reef is, is the one from the, the Loop Road of Bendigo, and the Prophet's Rock is from the, the High Terrace. And you think those lower slopes are the ones that have that more masculine, yeah. and yeah. then the higher ones, they're a bit more sheltered from the wind, yeah. and they yeah, yeah that and completely different soils up there as well. Mm. And I was going to add, Mike, I think you almost have to calibrate your palate in Polisago because you know, coming from De Beauvoir, you know, obviously you've got your palate calibrated to Messini and you can see the subtle differences, you know, of, of the different Premier Cruz and Chambon Messini and, and village level and, you know, Lou Messini and things like that. You come to Central Italia, it's, it's a different kettle of fish altogether, and you've got much more often than fruit. And it's, it's a, a matter of being able to sort of see, okay, yes, we've got more structured wines, perhaps coming from Giston, and then Bannock Burns with more plushness of fruit and uh, riper character, and maybe some, with some more elegance coming from Alexander, more sort of marginal climate. So it's, it's really a matter of, of, I think, the outside world you know, being able to understand the, the subtleties of, of differences because we're talking about another scale of Pinot Noir here. Yeah, there's so many complicated factors. Yeah, I yeah. think the fascinating one, I'd like your opinion on Sam, I've, I've been feeling that what we're learning now is that Alexandra is responding very, very well to vine age because it's a harsher climate down there. When the vines were young, they'd often really struggle. Now it's vines are probably getting deeper and more robust. Mm. They're really able to interpret that harsher climate more solidly. Do you think that? Well, I've had sort of double experience in uh, a repeated experience in Alexandria, and and what what's happened there it, 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 every time is is that the first two or three vintages uh, are completely wildly exuberant, and then. Uh, and then all, all, all of those vineyards have gone into decline for about five years yeah. and sent me into despair. Yeah. And then after seven or eight years, suddenly they're into a, into a whole other yeah. uh, ball game. And I don't know how to account for that. Yeah, it's probably just a time to take a look. But that's quite I typical of great vineyards, though, exactly what you're saying. You think they're almost going to die. You think, what have I done planting my body to? You, you had your first few years, you know, they were like really green and, you know, exciting and everything like that. And then they think, oh my God, you know, I've killed these yeah. vines. And then they come back. Um, and then they, they produce something incredible. Does, uh, does the uh, historical plantings of all the orchards around Alexandra have any effect of uh, the nearby uh, vineyards? When I, I don't really think that. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sam's got a vineyard on uh, all the horticultural research stations. Yeah. And we are Cornish Point vineyards in Old Africa orchards. And I think it's a really good idea to look for the places that the orchard is and sort of great for growing fruit mm. and use those to grow grapes. Because great to Yeah, a, I think there's a real connection between the head crops, mm -hmm. actually. And that's, yeah. that's what, um, when people started uh, planting 
further north, there's a new region um, uh, in the Waitaki, and they're all very excited about they've got limestone up there. But mm. they can't grow an apricot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what concerns me. <laughs> People are struggling up there as well, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, when we bought Cornish Point, I went round the local, because it was an apricot orchard, I went round to the local farmer, uh, farm, not, spoke to the wife, said, you know, kind of, can you tell me anything about whether the apricot is any good? And everybody said that's the first place that produces good apricots every year. Mm-hmm. And they always taste really good. And that's a great reason to buy a piece of land. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if pe- the, uh, the locals have all realised, hey, that's where the good food comes from. That's a really good understanding of how I use it. Mm-hmm. 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 That's it. Okay, well, I think uh, another great way of, of understanding terroir better is to actually look at the wine. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll, I think we're, first up, we're looking at two paddocks. So, uh, yeah. 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 
but only one person can make the last chance peanut, which is uh, yeah. only I can make that because it's my my little bit of soil, mm -hmm. and that's um, worth really worth. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you do get funky vintages, you know, like 2008. Let it express that vintage, you know, that, that people want to taste vintage variation. There's the ups and the downs and say, I, I can see that vintage in that one. I think it's important as well. Okay, next we're on to Mount Edwards, my number two, if everybody wants to look. Uh, Duncan Forsyth, um, owner and, and winemaker at Mount Edwards. Uh, <laughs> a real character himself, Mr. Natural. <laughs> great, great hand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And where's the worst tips in the world? Oh, <laughs> my God. If you ever go to this Pinot celebration, it's worth going alone just for the, the gala dinner on the night and to see what Duncan's going to show up in. His purple velveteen suit is my personal favorite. Oh, that, no, he wore the pale blue last year. Pale blue. Pale yeah, blue. Yeah, pale blue. blue. <laughs> And I think it was Dean Shaw, actually, your winemaker, who wore the purple velvet jeans. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Not something you want to encourage. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in a grown man. This is listed as a Gibson wine, but although the wine is from Gibson, I think most of the fruit from the is from the Yeah. Did you know that, Mike? Well, I asked Duncan um, what did he want me to put there, and he said he wanted me to put Gibson. So. I know that he's making wines under other labels. Um, well, uh, Mount Edward, something, um, Pinot Noir. So whether those um, Cromwell Basin wines are, are now... Uh, they're normally in the blend. Yeah, they, they normally are in the blend, but he wanted me to put Kipston in. There you go. Where he lives. Yeah. <laughs> It's an interesting state though, they've got some really nice sites. Yeah. Um, they're farming.